chapter four introduced the idea of intervals representing the area between a function and the x-axis. So we started with some approximation methods, looked at how to calculate the exact area as the limit of the number of rectangles approached infinity, talked about the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then started the idea of u substitution to evaluate intervals. So I'll start with some of the approximation methods and also talk about some of the exact calculations we did. So here what I'm interested in is the area um, between f of x equals x squared minus 3 and the x-axis between x equals negative 1 and x equals 2, which is somewhat up here as a result. And I'm going to look at three different approximation methods. LRAM, which represented the left rectangle approximation method, MRAM, the midpoint, and then the exact calculation. So what we're interested in is the interval between negative 1 and 2. The 3 denotes that we're going to put in three rectangles, so at x equals 0 and x equals 1. And then for the left rectangle approximation method, we're going to use the left endpoint of each of these intervals to calculate the height of the rectangle. So for example, the first rectangle would be one unit wide and using the value of the function at negative 1 to calculate it. The next rectangle would be one unit wide as well, using f of zero. And then the third rectangle would be one unit wide, using the value at f of one to calculate it. So then what you do is you substitute in the one, the zero, and the uh, negative one into the function. So this would be something like one times one minus three, plus one times zero minus three, plus one times one minus three to calculate that. MRAM, however, uses the midpoint of each interval. So for these uh, three intervals, I'm now going to use the middle point to calculate MRAM. So the width is still the same. It's still going to be 1. But now, instead of using f of negative 1, I'm going to use the value of the function at negative 1 half, and then the value of the function at positive 1 half, and then the value of the function at 3 halves. So this one's going to be 1 times 1 fourth minus 3, plus 1 times 1 fourth minus 3, plus 1 times 9 fourths minus 3. So there's three pieces. So those were two of the approximation methods we did. And then to calculate the exact, this is when we looked at the number of rectangles as it approached infinity, and calculate the summation of the area of those rectangles. So the function is x squared minus 3. I want to calculate the exact area between negative 1 and 2. So to just kind of start off really broad, the exact area is the limit as n approaches infinity. So summation from i equals 1 to n, that's where we add up the area of each of the rectangles. And then we had a base for the rectangles, which we represented as um, 3 over n, because from negative 1 to 2, there are 3 units. We're fitting in n rectangles, so each rectangle is going to be 3 over n units wide. And then we use the function to calculate the height of the rectangle. So since this interval started from negative 1, we included the negative 1, and then plus 3i over n to represent the value of each, um, the x value of each rectangle so that we can calculate the height correctly. So that was the general formula. And now we're going to start working it through. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity summation of i equals 1 to n, 3 over n I'm going to leave in there, and now this negative 1 plus 3i over n I'm going to substitute into the function. So negative 1 plus 3i over n quantity squared minus 3. And now we're going to start working through the algebra to see what this comes out to equal. So the limit as n approaches infinity, summation i equals 1 to n, 3 over n, square everything, you're going to get 1 minus 6i over n plus 9i squared over n squared minus 3. Simplify it, you're going to get limit as n approaches infinity, summation i equals 1 to n, 3 over n. If I simplify this, you get negative 2 minus 6i over n plus 9i squared over n squared. Distribute it out, limit as n approaches infinity summation i equals 1 to n, negative 6 over n minus 18i over n squared plus 27i squared over n cubed. 
So at this point, what we did was we applied the summation formulas. So you have the limit as n approaches infinity, negative 6 over n. If I sum that up n times, we're going to get n of those terms. So times n minus 18 over n squared, the summation of i was n, n plus 1 over 2, plus 27 over n cubed, and the summation of i squared was n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1, all over 6. Now, as I take the limit as n approaches infinity, the first term simplifies to negative 6. And then the remainder of the terms, what we looked at was basically the horizontal asymptote, the term that created the largest value. So in the numerator here, I have 18n squared. In the denominator, I have 2n squared. So that's going to simplify to negative 9. And then the last term, um, if I look at the largest term on top, I'm going to have 54 n cubed all over 6 n cubed. So put all that together and you end up with negative 6 as the area, which means that the majority of the function is underneath the x-axis, so you get your negative area as a result. Now we can always do a check, because we know how to do this with the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if I take the integral from negative 1 to 2 of x squared minus 3, you take your antiderivative, and your bounds. So if I substitute in my upper bound, I'm going to get 8 thirds minus 6. Substitute in my lower bound, plus 1 third minus 3, and you get negative 6. So it checks out. Uh, so we also did RAM, which is right rectangle approximation, but then we had two other approximations from section 6 in chapter 4, which was the trapezoid and the Simpsons. And then same thing, I want to do an exact calculation, but with ones that had uneven rectangles. So trapezoid formula looks something like this. It was b minus a over 2n. And if there were evenly divided tra trapezoids, then you did f of 0 plus 2f of 1 plus 2f of 2 plus 2f of 3 plus f of 4. And that only works if they were even because then they're evenly spaced apart. Each of the middle um, pieces get used twice, one for the trapezoid on the left and one for the trapezoid on the right. And this was the kind, trapezoid and Simpson, where both endpoints got used. So between 0 and 4, 1, 2, and 3, everything gets used, as opposed to like LRAM or RRAM for one of the endpoints does not get used. So if we set this up with our integral here, this would be 4 minus 0 over 2 times 4 square root of 0 plus 2 square root of 1, 2 square root of 2, 2 square root of 3, and then just square root of 4 at the end. So that was trapezoid's formula. Simpsons used parabolas to approximate the area of the um, function between, the, uh, under the function and the x-axis. So Simpsons' formula was b minus a over 3n, and the pattern here went 1, 4, 2, 4, and then 1 at the end. So 3, because 3 points are needed to define a trapezoid, um, the 4, 2, 4, 2 was to weight it so that basically the middle point got more weights to make the trapezoid curve. So the for setup here for this particular problem would be 4 minus 0 over 3 times 4, square root of 0, plus 4 square root of 1, 2 square root of 2, 4 square root of 3, and square root of 4. So altogether we had five different approximation methods, three involving rectangles, um, and two involving something else, one trapezoid and one parabola. Now, for this particular one, exact, if you recall, the problem was we couldn't take the square root of i, because there was no summation formula for the square root of i, so instead what we did was we defined x's that were not evenly spaced apart, but we could use our summation of i formula for it instead. So we let x of i equal 4 i squared over n squared. The 4 was because the interval went from 0 to 4. The i squared and the n squared was because if I substituted that into the function, you would end up with um, square rooting it and getting i over n, which you could then use the summation formula for. But that meant our delta x's 
we're going to end up being unevenly spaced because we would take each x value minus the previous value, value for your delta x, and that ends up being 4i plus 1 squared over n squared minus 4i squared over n squared. So notice as i changes values, these aren't going to be the same distance apart. So now I'm going to do our summation. So we have, again, the limit as n approaches infinity, summation i equals 1 to n. But now my width is this expression here, 4i plus 1 squared over n squared minus 4i squared over n squared. The height is still being defined by the function, so square root of 4 i squared over n squared. So you take this x sub i and substitute it into the square root function. So now we have the limit as n approaches infinity, summation. I'm going to start simplifying this. So if I square out the inside parentheses, 4i squared plus 2i plus 1 minus 4i squared over n squared. If I take the square root of this function, I get 2i over n. Limit is n approaches infinity, summation. The 4i squared cancel out, so I have 8i plus 4 over n squared times the quantity 2i over n. Distribute it out, limit as n approaches infinity, summation i equals 1 to n. 16i squared over 8i, or plus 8i over n cubed. And now I am going to separate it. So I'm going to have 16i squared over n cubed plus 8i over n cubed. So now if I use my summation formulas, I'm going to get the limit as n approaches infinity. 16 over n cubed, summation formula for i squared was n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1 all over 6. Um, summation formula for i is n, n plus 1 over 2. So again, if I look at the n behavior, I'm going to use the largest term on top and the largest term on bottom. This term here is going to equal 0 because I have n squared in the numerator and n cubed in the denominator. This one over here is going to equal 32 over 6, or 16 over 3 is my final answer. All right, so fundamental theorem of calculus, there were actually two parts to it. Um, we started with the fact that if we had capital F of X represent an area function, and it was specifically the area under lowercase f between some point and x, then I showed that the derivative of capital F of x was actually just equal to the inside term. And then the other one was if f of x is continuous on an interval between a and b, then the integral between a and b of f of x dx was equal to the antiderivative with the upper bound substituted in minus the antiderivative with the lower bound substituted in. Now be careful, remember it had to be continuous between a and b. So if you had something like the integral from negative 1 to 3 of 1 over x dx, that does not exist. Um, you can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus because it's not continuous at 0 as a result. So I think the second one most people are okay with. You just got to make sure it's continuous before you use it. So I want to kind of focus on the first one. So here's an example where I have an area function between 7 and e to the 3x of sine squared 5t minus 3. I'm not interested in taking the actual antiderivative of this, so we're going to use our fundamental theorem of calculus to work it out instead. So capital F prime of x is going to equal my integral sine squared of 5. In place of the t, you put in your bound, so that'll be e to the 3x minus 3. But you have to use chain rule because this up here, e to the 3x, is not just x. So you also have to take the derivative of what you're substituting in. So the derivative of e to the 3x is e to the 3x times 3. So that is my first piece. If you recall, if the variable is on the lower bound, then what you had to do was switch the order of integration and put a negative sign in instead. Then the second thing we did with the fundamental theorem of calculus was actually using a graph to interpret our information. So here I have f of x 
representing the area between negative 1 and x of g of x, where g of x is the graph that I showed here. So basically, I have a semicircle and um, two straight lines to put it together. So f of 2 would equal the integral from negative 1 to 2 of g of x dx. But an integral, if you recall, represents the area between the function and the x-axis. So between negative 1 and 1, I need to use a semicircle. So 1 half pi, 1 squared. And then between 1 and 2, I'm going to use this triangle here. And since it's underneath the x-axis, I have to represent that with negative area. So negative 1 half base times height would be the value of f of 2. So those two together. So you have pi over 2 minus 1 to represent that area. Now, for f prime of 3, we're going to use our fundamental theorem of calculus. So if this is equal to f of x, then f prime of x equals g of x. So all I'm going to do is take the x and substitute it in there, and you get f prime of x equals g of x. So that means that f prime of 3 equals g of 3. And if we look at our graph, g of 3 equals negative 1. So f prime of 3 equals negative 1. So continuing along this line, if f, if f prime of x equals g of x, then if I take the derivative of both sides, f double prime of x has to equal g prime of x. So f double prime of 4 has to equal g prime of 4. And g prime of 4 means I need the slope of g at uh, x equals 4. So again, if I go to my graph at x equals 4, if I calculate the slope there, the slope is 1. So f double prime of 4 equals 1. All right, now, we did a bunch of integrals. I'm not going to do every single possible example out there. Um, I want to show some of the ones that are a little bit more elusive. And same thing in Chapter 5. That's probably how I'm going to approach it. Rather than go through every single possible example, I want to just hit the ones that were a little bit harder, a little bit trickier, um, ones that you want to kind of remember the technique involved to put it together. So first things first, you want to always remember that an interval represents the area under a function. And that is exactly how we're going to talk about number one, because the graph of root 16 minus x squared is a semicircle. Square root means that it has to be the positive value. So this one, I want the area between the semicircle and the x-axis between negative 4 and 4. So 1 half pi 4 squared, or 8 pi, is the answer to the first one. So don't forget that integrals represent area between a function and the x-axis, because sometimes that'll help you put it together. Now the other kind of thing that did involve u substitution, so those are the next two examples I wanted to do. Typically, you want to let u equal your inside function. So when we had a radicand, we let u equal the radicand, took the derivative. So du dx equals 3, dx. So that means dx equals 1 third du. But we have this outside x that we have to solve for as well. So if we do that, you get x equals u plus 1 over 3. So I'm going to put all that information in. So in place of x, I'm going to put in u plus 1 over 3. Instead of square root of 3x minus 1, I'm going to use the square root of u. And instead of dx, I'm going to put in 1 third of u. So this makes it easier because now, instead of a radicand, I have a single term inside the radicand. And I can actually distribute this out. So first I'll take out the 1, 2, 1 third and make it 1 ninth. u plus 1, u to the 1 half. Now, I will distribute the u to the 1 half. So that becomes u to the 3 halves plus u to the 1 half du. And now I can apply my antiderivative technique. So this is going to be 1 ninth, 2 fifths u to the 5 halves plus 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus c. And then the last step is to replace the u's with x's. u was equal to 3x minus 1. So the answer here is 2 over 45, 3x minus 1 to the 5 halves, plus 2 over 27, 3x minus 1 to the 3 halves, plus c.
So letting u equal the inside function was one of our techniques. We also talked about how you just got to make sure you know your derivatives so you recognize maybe half of the integral can be a u and the other half can be a du. For example, the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So if I let u equal cotangent of x over 6, then the derivative du dx is going to equal negative cosecant squared x over 6. But you have to multiply by chain rule because the derivative of x to the 6 is 1 6. I need to solve for <coughs> cosecant squared x over 6 dx. So let's see, I'll multiply both sides by negative 6 and get negative 6 du equals cosecant squared x over 6 dx. So what this means is I can replace the following. The cotangent to the fifth, I can replace with u to the fifth. The cosecant squared x over 6 dx, I can replace with a negative 6 du. And so if I integrate that out, you're going to get negative u to the 6 plus c. And then replace your u, so u is equal to cotangent. So this is going to equal negative cotangent of x over 6 to the 6 plus So just a few examples of um, antiderivatives using u substitution. Like I said, I think most people can reverse the power rule OK now without any problems. The other one I think we did in chapter 4 was something like the integral of tangent squared 3x. But we had no integral for uh, tangents or no antiderivative for tangent squared. However, if we use our trig identities, we can rewrite this as secant squared 3x minus 1. And then we can separate it into two integrals, secant squared 3x dx minus 1 dx. The second half we can take care of, okay, this is basically equal to negative x plus c for this half. And then for the first half, you want to remember that secant squared is actually the derivative of tangent, so we can solve this side using a little bit of u substitution. For example, if you let u equal 3x, then your derivative du dx equals 3. So then dx equals 1 third du. So I can rewrite this front integral as integral of secant squared u, 1 third du which equals one-third tangent u, which equals one-third tangent 3x. So then the final answer is one-third tangent 3x minus x plus And I think I'm done.